Chapter 11, problems 17 and 21. Once again, similar to what I did in the last chapter, I selected two problems that are more advanced um, to, to model all of the steps in conducting a, a t-test, um, a repeat measures t-test. So number 17, research indicates that color, the color red increases men's attraction to women. In the original study, men were shown women's photographs presented on either a white or red background. Photographs presented on red were rated significantly more attractive than the same photograph mounted on white. In a similar study, a researcher prepares a set of 30 women's photographs with 15 mounted on a white background and 15 mounted on red. One picture is identified as the test photo and appears twice in the set, once on the white and once on the red. Each male participant looks through the entire set of photos and rates the attractiveness of each woman on a on the 10-point scale. The following table summarizes the ratings of the test photograph for a sample of nine men. Are the ratings for the test photograph significantly different when it is presented on a red background compared to white background? Use a two-tailed test with alpha 0.01. The data appears on the next page, but first we'll begin with our research and null hypothesis. So again, we're conducting a two-tailed test as indicated here. So we can say that the background color background color has no effect on attractiveness ratings. So regardless if the men are looking um, at a woman's picture mounted on the red background or the white background, the color will have no effect or no impact on their rating. And so therefore the mu difference right, is equal to zero. The research is stating that background color has an effect on attractiveness ratings. So given the uh, background color picture is mounted on, that will impact the um, way that the women, excuse me, how the men will rate the women in terms of their level of attractiveness. So mu d will not equal zero, that we anticipate that there will be a difference um, as a result of the difference in color. Again, the um, attractiveness ratings is the dependent variable, and the color of the background is the independent variable, and therefore we have two conditions, the white and the red. All right, um, what we need to do next is find our critical T, and that's contingent upon again being instructed to conduct a two-tailed test with alpha 0.01 and we need to um, identify what n is equal to. We had nine men in our sample so degrees of freedom would equal 9 minus 1 that's equal to 8. We're going to use that to find our critical t. Okay, So we're conducting a two-tailed test at 0.01. We have degrees of freedom equal to 8 and we find that our critical T is equal to 3.355, pretty high T, critical T value, a function of a very conservative alpha and low sample size, a small sample of nine individuals. So we should expect that our critical T would be um, difficult or one that would be hard to pass, a test that's hard to pass. So we have identified that our critical T is positive negative 3.355. We'll come back to that. What we're going to do now is use the raw data to calculate our sample mean difference. Notice it's not part of the data, the information given. So we have to calculate that information. So here's the raw data. We have participants A through I and they each have two X values. So the white background is considered the X1 distribution and red background x2 because um, first they're shown this test um, picture so again it's the same female 
they're looking at several different pictures, but there's one female that appears with both the back, white background and the red background. So when they see her with the white background, the X1 value is how they rated them, rated her. And then the second um, time they see her on the red background, we have different um, scores here. So now we're going to determine, did they really um, rate her statistically significantly differently in terms of her attractiveness simply because of the background color? So to do so, we're going to need to calculate our different scores. And we've learned that different scores is equal to condition 2x minus condition 1x value. So we're going to take 7 and minus 4 and we get 3. And the next one would be 7 minus 6 and we get 1. 8 minus 5, 3. 9 minus 5, 4. 9 minus 6, 3. 7 minus 4, we get 3, 9 minus 3, 6, 9 minus 8, 1, and 9 minus 6, 3. So let me just make sure I've gotten all of these correct. Um, Okay, so now what we've calculated is the difference between the first condition um, or the second condition and the first condition. And we see those are all positive numbers, so it is showing that they did rate the, the female as more attractive when she was presented um, with a red background. All right, so we're going to calculate our mean difference, the average of the differences. So it's going to be the sum of D over how many individuals we have. So we're going to calculate or, or take the sum of our D column here, our different scores. And if we take the summation of that, we should get 27. So our average difference, our average difference score is 27 over our sample size, which was equal to 9. And so we get a mean difference equal to 3. So MD is equal to 3. So on average, the um, female is rated um, more attractive on average by three points higher than she was rated in the white background. All right, next we need to calculate the sum of squared deviations for our D values. So our new process, again, we're calculating SS, but it's for our D value. So the equation um, that we learned in chapter four was the sum of X, but now we're talking about not x values, but the difference between x2 minus x1. So it's going to be the sum of our d squared minus the sum of d. We're going to square that summation over n. Now we can replace variables. Uh, let's replace what we, we know already. Uh, we know the sum of d, we just calculated, that's 27. We're going to square that over n, which is 9. And what's missing is this. We have to square all our d values to get the sum of d squared. Okay, so 3 squared, 9. 1 squared, 1. 9. 16. 9. 9. 36. 1. And 9. So now we can take the sum of all our difference scores that have been squared. So we take the summation of this column and we should get 99. So now we have this value. Again, we're calculating the sum of squared um, deviation scores for our differences. Um, again, the difference was second condition value minus the first condition value to give us this, the difference between conditions. All right, so we could take 27, square it, divide by 9, and subtract that from 99. So in our calculators, again, 27 squared, divide by 9, and then subtracted from 99. And we should get 18. So now we have the sum of square deviations for our D values, for our differences scores. And given that, we'll use it to calculate our estimated, our estimated standard error of the mean difference. Um, but to do that, we're going to need our 
variance. So we know that this is equal to variance over n, and we take the square root of that to get our estimated standard error, the mean difference. But first we need to calculate our variance. So variance is equal to SS over DF. We just found that our SS is equal to 18 degrees of freedom equal to 8. So we get SS, excuse me, variance equal to 18 divided by 8, 2.25. And now, using that value, we can calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference. So it's equal to 2.25 over 9, and we take the square root. So in our calculators, 2.25 divided by 9 and take the square root. So our estimated standard error of the mean difference is equal to 0.5. So again, from beginning to end, we have our raw data. We first calculate our D scores to get our average difference, in this case was equal to three. Then we need to calculate the sum of squared deviations for our D values. So we must square all our D values, all our different scores, and take the summation. And given our equation for SS, we get SS is equal to 18. The sum of squared deviations is equal to 18. And with that, we're able to calculate our variance. So variance is 18 divided by 8, and we got 2.25. And then, again, that enabled us to calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference. Again, this is representing, on average, how much we would expect um, the difference to be between m, d, and mu, d. Right? So the sample mean difference in relation to the hypothesized population mean difference, we'd expect that um, there are always going to be some discrepancies when we take a sample, and this is kind of thought of as the, the wiggle room, so 0.5 above zero, 0.5 below zero, and that's what we would anticipate as um, natural discrepancies between sample statistics and population parameters. Okay, so we're going to revisit what our critical T was. We had found the critical T was equal to 3.355, and now we can draw this out. Again, it was a two-tailed test that we're conducting, so negative 3.355 and positive 3.355. We just found our, defined our critical region, and again, in the center we have the null represented by mean difference equal to zero. And again, the estimated standard error of the mean difference says that um, natural discrepancies between sample statistics population um, parameters will reside 0.5 above zero and 0.5 below zero. So that's kind of framing the common region of, of natural discrepancies between those values. And now we want to see if our t value is significantly different from that. So we can calculate our t value. Our t is equal to md minus mu d over estimated standard error of the mean difference. And we have everything we need to calculate these values. So our mean difference, we calculated that to equal 3. The mu difference is equal to 0 coming from the null, stating that we expect no difference between these conditions Again, affirming that the background color has no effect on the attractiveness ratings. And then divided by estimate standard error of the mean difference, which we calculated to equal 0.5. So now we can calculate our t value. So 3 divided by 0.5, and we get a t value equal to 6 going to use that to compare where it is in relation to the null value, which says the mean difference would equal to zero, and then also, um, more importantly, our critical t that was um, established using our two-tailed test, alpha at 0.01. And we see here that 
or her T value is well into the critical region, we get to reject the null. And at this time, we know that the probability of obtaining that value is less than our alpha. And it's a, there's a less than a 1% chance that we would get a T statistic for the mean difference of three um, if the null were true. Given that, we're, um, even, even though we weren't asked to do this, I'm going to go ahead and do some additional statistics just to model, again, more of the uh, things that we learned in this chapter. We'll start with the estimated D. Estimated D is equal to the mean difference over our standard deviation. And we don't have standard deviation. What we did calculate in the previous example was variance. And our variance was equal to... 2.25. So to get our standard deviation, we would simply take the square root of 2.25. And that should give us 1.5. So our mean difference is equal to 3. And our standard deviation, we just calculate, is equal to 1.5. So 3 divided by 1.5 is equal to 2. And that's a very significant Cohen's D. Again, remember, point, anything above 0 0.8 is large. So we're saying that the difference between the hypothesized population mean difference, which is 0, and a, and a mean difference of 3 is equal to 2 standard deviation units. So this is very um, significant. And again, we would deem that as being very high effect. Again, illustrating that the men did rate the female significantly different when they were presented, or when she was presented on a red background opposed to the white background. All right, the next thing um, I'd like to calculate is R squared, and I'll do that on the next page. So R squared is equal to T squared over T squared plus degrees of freedom. We can replace variables our T is equal to 6, and then 6 squared added to our degrees of freedom in this example equal to 8. And so we have 36, and then 36 plus 8 gives us 44. So 36 divided by 44 gives us 0.818, or we would say 0.82. And what this is saying is that 82% of the difference in attractiveness ratings is due to the difference in background color. Which is very high, it's a very high effect. So anything above 0.25, 25% of the difference explained by the treatment or difference in quasi-independent variable um, is considered very significant. And here we're saying 82% of the difference in how the males rated the female based on the background color um, is due to the fact that there was a difference in background color. So it had nothing to do with the female herself. She was exactly the same. The photo was exactly the same on the when it was mounted on a white background as well as the red background. And so the only reason they rated her different um, in terms of her attractiveness level is because the color red has an impact on the men. Something to consider, gentlemen, when um, you see a woman, uh, you can determine if perhaps you think she's more attractive because of the color she's wearing. And women, you may want to wear red if you want to attract a certain male because now we've determined that men are attracted to the color red. All right, I'd like to, at this point in the semester, point out how we can use these things in our own lives and that what we're learning about is um, applicable to our everyday social interactions. 
The last thing I'd like to do again, not something that we were asked to, but um, it just dawned on me that I haven't given you an example or a model of a confidence interval for this chapter. So let's do a confidence interval at 95%. So we're going to determine what the mean difference would be if um, we were able to test all men and use this example of, of different background colors um, for rating women's attractiveness. So our equation, we're calculating the hypothesized um, or the treated population mean difference, the treated population mean difference. We're going to use our sample mean difference as a basis or default of this calculation and then add and subtract the product of our t value multiplied by our estimated standard error of the mean difference. Again, this is not, not t statistic that we just calculated. The t comes from the confidence interval percentage and our degrees of freedom. So let's identify that again. Our degrees of freedom for this particular example is equal to 8. And the difference between 95% and 100 is 5%. So again, what we're calculating is if we had access to the entire population of men, um, we want to find out what their mean difference would be in terms of the ratings, the attractiveness ratings that we're going to calculate mu d here and mu d here. And it's going to be centered around how the sample performed. And we know the sample mean difference was equal to 3. So it's going to be a range centered around this value of 3. So now we're going to calculate or find our t value for our equation. And we already know what our estimated standard error, the mean difference, is equal to. That's equal to 0.5. Okay, so let's use our t table to find out what this t value is equal to. Okay, so here's our t distribution, our degrees of freedom equal to 8. Um, when we're calculating con um, confidence interval, it's always a two-tailed process. We were cal calculating confidence interval 95%, so what's left over is 5%. And so we're going to see what those two things intersect. And we get 2.306. So our t value in our equation is 2.306. 306. And so now with this equation, we can calculate what we would anticipate the population mean difference to equal if we had access to all males and were able to test this difference in color on um, the attractiveness of a female. Okay, so on the low end, our mean difference would equal 1.8, 1.85. And on the high end, 4.15. So again, we've just calculated that we're 95% confident that if we had access to the entire population of males and were able to test them using this independent variable of changing color and the dependent variable of attractiveness rating, that the difference between the conditions, the red condition minus um, the white condition, the difference um, would range from 1.85 to 4.15. Again, the null is equal, the null is represented by mu d is equal to zero. Notice that that value is not in that range. Zero would be somewhere over here in our distribution of um, sample mean differences. And again, since it's not in that range, it, it affirms that we are accurate in rejecting the null hypothesis. Um, because we don't anticipate that the difference will equal zero if we had access to the entire population of males and were able to subject them to this high type of research scenario. So again, we're 95% confident that the average mean difference between the two conditions would fall within a range of 1.85 and 4.15. Okay, now we can write our concluding statement again. We know that we got to reject the null, and that results indicated that the background color does have 
significant effect on attractiveness ratings. And we conducted a t-test where degrees of freedom were equal to 8. Our t-statistic was equal to 6.00. Our probability statement indicates that it's there's less than a 1% chance that we would obtain a t-value equal to 6 or a mean difference equal to 3 if the null were true. And we calculated d was equal to 2.00. Again, the difference between the population, the hypothesized population mean difference, mu d, is equal to zero. And our sample, sample mean difference, which was equal to three, oops, that's a zero, three. The difference from here to here is two standard deviation units. Again, very significant. We calculate R squared, normally you wouldn't provide both, but since we calculated both, that was 0.82. 82% of the difference in scores was due to the color, the change in background color. And then we calculated confidence interval at 95%. And we concluded that we're 95% confident that the average difference between conditions would fall within a range of 1.85 and 4.1. Five, excuse me, one five. And that would be our conclusion for this particular research. Again, showing that um, the, the color, background color, did have a significant impact on the attractiveness ratings. Number 21, some evidence suggests that you are likely to improve your test score if you rethink and change answers on a multiple choice exam. To examine this phenomenon, a teacher gave the same final exam to two sections of a course. Students in one section were told to turn in their exams immediately after finishing without changing any answers. In the other section, students were encouraged to reconsider each question and to change answers when they felt it was appropriate. Before the final, the teacher matched nine students in the first section with nine students in the second section based on their midterm grades. For example, a student with in the no change section with an 89 on the midterm was matched with a student in the change section who also had an 89 on the midterm. The final exam scores for nine matched pairs of students are presented in the table below. They're actually on the next page. This is an, um, a match subject design. We learned in the previous video that um, a match subject design is somewhat of a hybrid between the independent measures t-test and a repeat measures t-test. The um, reason it's somewhat of a hybrid is because we have two conditions made up of two different individuals. However, the way it, it's um, similar to the repeat measures is that you can think of that um, matched person as their twin. So um, we again base it on in this case, the midterm, and that's the characteristic that we're holding constant so that those things are similar across the two conditions. So again, we're using two different groups of individuals. Um, nonetheless, we can treat them as though they're the same um, when it comes to calculating our T statistic. Before we go any further, I'm going to write our, um, well, A says, do the data indicate a significant difference between the two conditions? and conduct a two-tailed test with alpha 0.05. So our research hypothesis, um, since it just says a difference, we'll say that changing answers has no effect on final test results. So whether you take time to change your answers or not, well, we won't see a significant difference in the average um, test scores for these different conditions. So mu d would equal zero, no difference between conditions. The research says that changing answers 
does have an effect. on final test scores or results. So it, for those who don't take the time to change answers, their scores will be different than those who do. So mu d does not equal zero. We expect them to perform differently, um, those who change versus those who don't change. So now to determine if there's a difference, we're going to need to calculate um, the average difference and see which condition produces um, you know, a difference in scores, or scores that are greater. So we'll analyze the data on the next page. Um, before we do so, let's identify our critical t-value. And again, that's based on two-tailed test, alpha at 5%, and degrees of freedom. So we need to know how many individuals we're working with. It said we matched nine, to nine individuals. So n minus 1, so degrees of freedom would equal 9 minus 1, and we get 8. And now we're going to use that to find our critical t in the t-table. Okay, so our degrees of freedom equal to 8. We're conducting a two-tailed test at 5%. So where they intersect, positive negative 2.306. So our critical t, positive negative 2.306. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, right now we're going to look at the data. Okay, so we have our matched pairs um, of nine individuals and we have the score, their final exam score for condition one when they didn't change their answers, they didn't review their answers, and then condition two when they did take time to review their answers. Um, so it looks just by a quick analysis that the students who took the time to change or review answers, um, their end results were somewhat higher in some cases, or at least in one con case it was lower, but overall it seems that they did better. Those who took the time to review their questions and answers and make changes accordingly did better. Um, let's calculate our Different scores, again, difference is equal to x2 minus x1. So how did the second condition um, do in relation to the first? So our first one is 86 minus 71 is 15. And I'm going to do the rest again. All I'm doing is taking my first condition, 86, and then subtracting 71. So the next one would be 80 minus 68. I'm going to pause and do all of those so we save ourselves a little time on the video. Okay, so again, the way I calculate the d values is just taking the second condition, subtracting the first, and it just looks like um, the match pair number three, they did worse when they reviewed their um, answers opposed to the condition where they just submitted their answers without reviewing. But overall, these positive numbers show that second condition was higher. So let's take the sum of our d values, the sum of our different scores, so that we can calculate the mean difference. So again, it's the sum of d over n. We know that n is equal to 9. So let's take the summation again of our d values in this column. And we should get the sum of d equal to 63. So 63 divided by 9 gives us 7. So on average, the difference in, in uh, points would be equal to 7. Now we need to calculate the sum of squared deviations for our different scores, and our equation is the sum of d squared minus the sum of d squared over n. And let's replace what we know. We know the sum of d, we just calculated that, that's 63. We're going to square that. n is equal to 9, so what's missing is this. So we're going to now square all our d values. And again, I'm going to pause and, and do those calculations again. All I'm going to do is take 15 and square it, 12 squared, negative 3 squared. Um, so give me one second. Okay, so I've um, squared all our difference scores, and now we need to take the sum of all of those scores that have been squared. And if we take the summation of that column, we should get 729. 729. So to calculate SS, we take 63, we square that, divide by 9, and subtract it from 729. And when we do that calculation, we should get the sum of square deviations equal to 288. 
Okay, so with this value, we can now calculate our variance. And I'm just going to partition this off. So given this value, our, our SS, we can calculate our variance, which is SS over DF. So variance would equal 288 over our degrees of freedom equal to 8. And we get 36. And with that, we can calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference, which is the square root of our variance over n. So estimated standard error of the mean difference is equal to 36 over 9. We take the square root of that. So 36 divided by 9 and take the square root. 36 divided by 9 is 4, and then take the square root, and we get, whoops, a daisy. get estimated standard error of the mean difference to equal 2. Okay, so again, using the raw data, we can calculate our different scores, our different scores squared. Um, first, we are able to calculate the average difference using the sum of D, and then we need to calculate the sum of squared deviations for our D scores, and again, we were able to calculate 288, having that we are able to calculate our variance, and then finally our estimated standard error of the mean difference, which is equal to 2. Now we have everything we need to calculate our t-statistic and then um, compare it to our critical region. Okay, so just to review our critical t that we found earlier was 2.306. So we have negative 2.306, positive 2.306, and in the center, the um, hypothesized population mean difference equal to zero. And so we've established a critical region. If we fall in this area, we get to reject the null hypothesis. So we're going to calculate our t, or t is equal to... MD minus mu D over estimated standard error of the mean difference. We have um, the average difference was calculated to equal 7 minus 0 over estimated standard error of the mean difference. We just calculated that it's equal to 2. And so our T is equal to 7 divided by 2, and we get 3.5, pretty large T value. And now we're going to look at where it resides in our distribution, and we find that it is in the critical region. So we know at this point we're going to reject the null. And the probability of obtaining that t value or mean difference, the t value of 3.5 or a mean difference of 7, is less than our alpha, and our alpha was set at 0 0.05. So there's less than a 5% chance that we would get an mean difference of 7 if the null were true. Again, lending um, the evidence to support um, the hypothesis and reject the null hypothesis. We weren't asked to calculate d or r squared, but as I've done in the previous examples, let's go ahead and calculate those for extra um, practice. So estimated d is equal to mean difference over standard deviation. Um, and we don't have our standard deviation. We had our variance. Our variance was equal to was equal to 36. So our standard deviation would be the square root of 36, and that would be 6. So our mean difference of 7 divided by 6. So in our calculator, 7 divided by 6, we get 1.17 if we round. So the difference, the mean difference, um, the null, which said mu d was equal to 0. And now this distribution of sample mean differences where the mean difference is equal to 7. We're saying the difference from here to here is 7 points, but equivalent to 1.17 standard deviation units. And again, anything above 0.8 is significant, so it's a it's a big difference between the hypothesized population mean of 0 and the sample statistic 
um, of 7. And that difference in distance, again, it's measuring it in the average or standardized value, is 1.17 standard deviation units. Very high effect. And then our r squared is equal to t squared over t squared plus degrees of freedom. t is equal to 3.5. We're going to square that. 3.5 squared plus our degrees of freedom of 8. R squared is equal to 12.25. 12.25 plus 8 gives us 20.25. So now 12.25 divided by 20.25, and we get 0.64, excuse me, 60. And now what we're saying, I'm going to give myself a little more room over here, so that um, statistic tells us that 60% of the difference in test scores between the conditions, those who stopped and changed their answers accordingly and those who just submitted it right after the exam. So 60% of the difference in test scores is due to the difference in test conditions. Test conditions meaning again, one group was instructed to turn in their exam immediately when they finished, the other one was instructed to review their answers and make changes accordingly. So 60% of the difference in scores, the average difference in this case was 7 points. 60% of that 7 point average difference is due to the fact that they did something different in both conditions. And since it's a positive number, we would also say that their test scores are higher because they stopped and reviewed their responses and made changes accordingly opposed to those who submitted immediately when they finished. All right, one last thing we're going to calculate, which is the confidence interval at 95%. We're going to calculate 95% confidence interval, so we're going to calculate the true population mean difference. Um, that calculation is centered around the sample statistic added and, and subtracted to the, this product, t value multiplied by our estimated standard error, the mean difference. So mu d is equal to the mean difference, sample mean difference is equal to 7, plus or minus, we'll find our t. And the estimated standard error of the mean difference is equal to 2. Okay, to find that t value, again, we're talking about finding this range of the true population mean based on the sample statistic, which was equal to md was equal to 7. We're going to find a range on the lower end to this higher end. And um, again, that's 95% confidence, so 95% of the time the mean difference would fall within this range. And again, the difference is 5%, so we convert that to proportion of 0 0.05. The two-tailed test um, and degrees of freedom are needed to calculate um, or to find our t value for this equation. Again, our degrees of freedom equal to 8. Okay, so two-tailed process because it's a, a value above and below the center. 95% um, means let's over, left over, 5% is left over. Degrees of freedom equal to 8. And our t value is 2.306. Again, this was the same as our critical t, um, simply because it was a two-tailed test at 5%. So using the same parameters, but again, just recognize that the t in your confidence interval is not always going to be the same as your critical t. It just depends on what confidence percentage um, you've been asked to calculate. So that t is equal to 2.306. And now we'll calculate what the value is on the low end and the high end. So in our calculators, 2.306 times 2, so we have mean difference, population mean difference equal to 7 plus or minus this product of 4.612.
So plus 7, we, we get um, a value on this end equal to 11, 11.61. And on the lower end, we get a value of 7 minus 4.612, 2.1. Nine, if we round, so we're ninety-five percent confident that if we were to set up every um, final exams in this in, in this manner, where one group is told to um, change answers and and um, we would measure the difference between those who don't change answers, ninety-five percent um, of the time that mean difference will fall within a range of 2.39 to 11.61. Again, the fact that it's positive means that the, those who take time to stop, review their answers, and change answers accordingly will score higher on assessments compared to those who do not. And again, the null is represented, null is represented by mu d equal to 0. We see that that is not in the range, and 0 would be somewhere over here. And um, again, affirming that we are confident in rejecting the null because the confidence interval does not include that value of zero. So again, we're 95% confident that if we had access to the population, we're able to administer this treatment. These treatments, um, the difference between the two conditions would fall within a range of 2.39 to 11.61. So our final concluding statement would read as such. So reject. The null results indicate that changing answers, if we want to add, you know, stopping and reviewing and changing answers accordingly, um, had a significant effect on final exam scores. And again, here we're showing that those who did took the time to do that scored higher. So at this point, we may do a one-tailed test, follow up with a one-tailed test, and the hypothesis be revised that those who take the time to review and change answers accordingly will score higher um, than those who don't. The initial hypothesis here was a two-tailed broad non-directional test, but again, showing that since we've already shown significance at a two-tailed test, we can retest using the one-tailed and see if we um, are able to then draw conclusions that that condition ye always yields higher values on an exam, um, those who change the answers compared to those who do not. We conducted a t-test with degrees of freedom equal to 8, our t-statistic was equal to 3.5, our, the probability of obtaining that value is less than alpha. Our D was equal to, um, let's see here, 1 point, 1.17. And our R squared was equal to 0 0.60. And we conducted a 95% confidence interval which gave us a range of 2.39 through 11.61.